you want me to just do the correct mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see if this works. So now what hey. I'm going to do is step away. I'm going to step away from my other computer there so there's no echo. So the other computer is just recording it. Oh, uh, we'll see if okay. it works. I don't really know how to use any of this modern technology. I just design, <laughs> invent, and build things. But I don't know how to use I don't know how to use other people's things. So we'll just do Oh, now hang on a second. I'm having all this noise from the street, so I'm going to close my window for a sec. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's an old fashioned uh, kind of problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I, I'm delighted to be able to uh, talk to you for MIT's Alumni Association. We do an online, um, like a blog called Slice of Life, uh, where this did appear. We usually put things up on social media and various stuff like that. And, you know, it's just a way of connecting people back to the Institute, seeing how it's affected them and, you know, what they've been doing since. So, um, you know, it's a typical profile. I'd love it if you could just start a little bit at the beginning. I understand that your grandfather's welding uh, was something that got you started. Uh, you know, tell me about how you got into your life's work. Well, I guess since childhood, I've been interested in inventing things. And uh, so one of the things is my grandfather taught me to weld when I was about four years old. And, you know, when you're welding, you have these welding helmets that you look through and see the world and so i kind of invented a new kind of welding helmet that is like using vision computer vision camera systems i had this vision of a welding helmet that uses video to see the world and i invented something called hdr high dynamic range imaging which was to capture multiple differently exposed images and cement them together to really understand scientifically the quantity of light present in the scene and i created a mathematical foundation known as comparometric equations. So I invented something I called comparometric equations, which are equations that compare different, uh, sort of a, a metric of comparison between differently gained measurements of the same thing. So many measuring instruments that you have, like this 1935 cathode ray oscillograph that my dad got for me when I was 12. Oh, that's so cool someone was throwing it away. And of course, it'll have different gain settings on it, you know. Um, and any of these oscillographs, like this this is from the 1930s, this one from the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, and so on. And they have different sensitivity settings. And so you can adjust the sensitivity up or down. And cameras are like that as well. You know, you can adjust the sensitivity of the exposure. And so what I realized is that what I want to do, instead of just taking one measurement, what I did is I measured the same thing at a low sensitivity, at a medium sensitivity, and at a high sensitivity, and combined that measurement information all together. So that's what comparometric equations does. It's a mathematical foundation for combining differently gained measurements of the same phenomenon. So for example, differently exposed photographs of the same subject matter or differently measured radar returns from a radar set having a low sensitivity, a medium sensitivity and a high sensitivity. And this is what leads to the first ITAP, right? Which I think you did even before you came to MIT. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I built the wearable computer back in the in the 1970s. 1974, I invented this thing, wearable computer here. You can see it here. Uh, there, there is the wearable computer, which is is it sort of started with this this oscilloscope in my childhood. In some ways. Um, I, the time base on it didn't work, and so I had to move it back and forth to see the time base. I wanted to see the time base, so I put it on rollers. I put it on this thing with wheels on it. Like what is that. the time base? I don't even know what that is. Well, an oscillograph is a machine for drawing graphs, and it normally has a time base because it normally draws graphs as a function of time. Sure. And so the time base wasn't working on it, so the dot which would normally go across the screen from left to right, was sitting still. 
And it would still go up and down when I put voltage on it, on the input. But the time base wasn't working. The dot didn't move from left to right. Okay. And so uh, it was broken time base. And so I put it on a, 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 a wheels like, like this so that I could roll it back and forth. Sure. Just to see. I just was lazy and wanted to see. I was eventually going to fix it, of course, but I just quickly wanted to see something. So I moved it back and forth. And in so doing, I discovered an interesting phenomenon. That is to say, I discovered that I could get a uh, see a waveform of something physical from the real world in real time. As I moved it back and forth, I had it connected to this uh, radar set police radar, marine radar, different kinds of radar sets I was playing around with, had it connected to the radar set. And when I moved it, I could see this thing as a function of time and space, as if it, as a function of, of space without time, you know, so that I could see the waveform as if it was sitting still. And so I discovered this thing, what now people would call I guess Yu Yuan, uh, in a way, says that I created the the foundations of the metaverse, <laughs> the, the, the original. Um, I called it MetaVision because you know when the police are watching us with the radar, that's vision. And if you have a radar detector, that's a sensor of sensors sensing sensors. And of course, then the police have radar detector detectors to see if you have a radar detector. And then, of course, you could build a radar detector, detector, detector to see if the police have a radar <laughs> detector. And so this is MetaVision, the sensing of sensors and the sensing of their capacity to sense. And so in a way, what I invented was a MetaVisual universe. Uh, and the MetaVisual universe was, is to see things that like to see radio waves and see sound waves and see a microphone's capacity to listen and see a camera's capacity to see. So I also did these pictures of surveillance cameras in my childhood. I was sort of fascinated with the idea of photographing surveillance cameras and the and the capacity to see the capacity of the surveillance camera to see. So these pictures of the surveillance camera show its capacity to see, and that's meta vision. And so this MetaVision universe that I created in 1974, you know, Yu Yuan, president of the IEEE Standards Association, sort of credits me with the, the first uh, steps to what is the timeline of the metaverse. Well, I know that that, you know, I saw an interesting, I think it was a TED talk where you talked about surveillance versus surveillance. So that's always been interesting. But I wonder as we, uh, as we move forward from childhood, then, how does it come that you get to MIT? I know you've, at, well, I actually, I don't know what your degrees are in. You're at McMaster, you have three different degrees. What are those degrees in? So I had, uh, I had a degree in physics and in electrical engineering. Okay, so the, the bachelor's of science would be physics and the bachelor of engineering would be electrical engineering. Yeah. And then, and then you have a master's also in electrical engineering? Yes. Okay, and that's, and then you come to MIT, uh, at the media lab, and I understand you're founding the wearable computer lab. So how did that happen? Why why MIT? What did we do for you? What did you do for us? Well, it just it seemed like the right fit. It seemed like the right kind of people who were into technology. Uh, I seemed to connect in that world. Um, so when I arrived there, I thought, oh, this is this is really cool. This is fun. I met lots of interesting mathematicians. You know, I met Victor Guillemin took his harmonic analysis course, uh, 18103, very inspiring. Uh, I was also very inspired by Michael Arton, uh, you know, 18701 algebra. Uh, so just, I, I, I formed this concept I called video orbits, which is uh, using an algebraic construct of, of orbits uh, to reference or relate successive frames of visual imagery and so another one of my inventions was panoramic imaging, you know, putting, combining a whole bunch of pictures together to make one larger picture of increased, uh, not only increased dynamic range, but also increased domain. So the domain and the range of the function would both increase as you looked around and combine multiple images together. 
Yeah, I have a great picture. And one of the things that inspired our conversation today was that somebody saw a picture of the wearable computing lab from this early 80s. I sent it to you in the first email. I don't know whether you had, I think it's actually your photo. So it's- Yeah, yeah, I took that picture. Um, uh, I put my camera system across the street and remotely activated it. So it's a selfie. I'm the one standing <laughs> on the left and activating the camera. I set the camera up and, and there are- uh, a number of people wearing computers there. Uh, all of those are machines that I built, except for the one on the far right, which was just a commercial off-the-shelf text screen. But the others, the others were all machines that I built, um, and you know, ham radio equipment uh, to connect online wirelessly because there's no wireless service. So I put an antenna on the roof of the media lab. There's no other antenna then. Uh -huh. So mine was the only one. And then uh, so actually, so you're wirelessly at that point connecting that can like for the purposes of the picture, you're actually using a wireless thing you set up. Yeah, yeah. I created uh, probably the world's first cyborg community wireless. I uh, applied to New England Spectrum Management Council to get a spectral allocation for a community of cyborgs. And I built <laughs> the world's first community of cyborgs you know wirelessly connected i had the first in the world wearable wireless webcam streaming live video on the internet wherever i walked around so like what we're so doing that was now, during your time at mit yeah yeah what we're doing mm -hmm. now seems seems uh, pretty normal you know i'm walking around right. talking to you with live video streaming so it's pretty routine but at the time such things didn't exist so I, I invented and built and created the the first uh, wearable wireless uh, internet uh, streaming web camera system. Yeah, I, it's just, it's so amazing to think about. I mean, I was in college in the 80s, so I'm aware of where we've come from, very present in my mind, you know. I mean, I had a very early, I had a K-Pro portable computer that, you know, was like, you know, a ton that you carried with a handle. <clears throat> Yeah, but I wonder, you know, that I think brings you to the question of yeah, well, there's what, one of my early. What is your thinking in terms of why you've spent so much of your life with a computerized eyewear on your head? <laughs> I think that's a big question for lots of people, particularly going back to when it wasn't so streamlined. You know, those early pictures. You're carrying some serious stuff around with you and wearing a helmet and everything else. Yeah, I guess I had a vision of this idea of being connected in day to day life you know, uh, physiological sensors that monitor health and well-being and just being online in the in the in the world. And this idea of metavision, you know, predecessor of metaverse, I guess, metavision as a as a sort of shared um a lot of what I I, I did was to build at the nexus, at the intersection of nature, technology and humanity. If you think of nature, the natural world, the world of atoms, the physical world, reality, that's one circle, if you will. Think of three circles. The natural right. world of physical reality, that's planet Earth, let's say. Planet Earth is blue, so we'll say a blue circle represents reality or nature, the natural world, Earth, the environment, nature, physics. Physicos is a is a Greek word that means uh, nature. Um, and uh, um, so the world of physics, the world of atoms, and that physical world is the blue circle. And then you can think of a Venn diagram made of three circles. Then the, the next circle is, let's say, think of a green circle for technology. And the reason I think of the green circle is, of course, because the screens, these round uh, television screens and cathode ray tubes and oscilloscope screens, ah. the green glow of the oscilloscope screen from the 1930s and 1940s and 1950s, that's 1959 there, and so on. This one over here is 1959. Um, You're a big collection of these. Yeah, it was something I was fascinated with in my childhood. My dad got one of those for me that someone was throwing away when I was 12 years old, and that opened my mind. That was kind of like my uh, Hiroshi Ishii abacus, if you will. 
you know, have you ever read Hiroshi Ishii's story of the abacus? No. You know, he's an MIT professor, and he said what really unlocked his mind or really triggered his thinking was an abacus because, uh, you know, that was a kind of a machine that opened his mind to a lot of ways of thinking. So sort of my Ishii abacus, if it will, if you will, is is the it was this this cathode ray tube you know the electrical tube that was transparent you see in the older tubes it's completely transparent so you could see inside this clear glass tube yeah so you can see right inside there it's all clear you can see the electron beam you can see everything in there it's completely transparent technology that's totally open and easy to understand <clears throat> And so that represents the technology circle, the second circle in the Venn diagram, the green circle. Yep. And then lastly, we've got the red circle, which I think of as the human, humanity. So you've got the, the atoms, which is the, 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 the blue circle. You've got bits, which is the green circle. And you've got, say, genes, let's say, which is the red circle, the human circle, the circle of humanity. And you're trying to work at things that put those pieces together. Yeah, at the intersection of atoms, bits, and genes, let's say. At, or, or just to use ordinary everyday language, at the intersection of nature, technology, and humans. And what do you see that we don't? Well, what I see is that I see uh, people look poking at this from different directions. So I see, for example... You've got MIT, mens a manus, mind and hand, atoms and bits, the first two circles, the, the blue and the green circles. And then we've also got the world of computer science and HCI, human computer interaction, which is humans and technology, which is the, uh, the red and green circles. But what I'm trying to do is put all three of those together and say, well, we call it mercivity. Mercivity is technology, immersive technology that you can submerse. And by that, do you mean it, it's so uh, in everything that you can kind of forget about it, maybe like electricity? Well, uh, what I mean is that traditional technology, if it's immersive, it immerses you, but it's on one sided. You know how surveillance and surveillance has balance? Yeah. You're being watched, but you can also watch. Right. Uh, likewise, immersive technology needs to have that same ethos of balance. It immerses you, but you have to be able to submerse it. So if it's immersive, you know, it immerses you and you can immerse it. Okay. And and uh, this means that that uh, it surrounds you, but then we are the cyborg with this technology on. We're all cyborgs with these technologies, but these technologies are keeping us out of nature. So let's say I've seen so many people with a smartphone, you know, they, they go down to the beach. They're not going to jump in the lake, right? Because the phone right. will get wet and it'll damage the phone. And then they say, oh, am I going to leave it on the beach where someone could steal it? Or am I going to jump in the water with it where it will be damaged by the water? So it kind of keeps us out of nature. Technology right. immerses us and it keeps us, it swallows us alive and prevents us from engaging with the real world and understanding reality around us. Well, that's the kind of thing that me, as more of a Luddite, would embrace. So, yeah, well, you know, in my book, there's a dichotomy I there, right? It seems like uh, the person who has, you know, been embracing technology since childhood and is always using things that that seems like getting away from nature but you know i do know you i think you have something currently that's even about getting into the water right so yeah tell me about how technology can in fact bring those pieces together because it seems counterintuitive well you've mentioned luddite, luddite a few times in my book i describe that's myself as a cyborg luddite that's interesting <laughs> that's so funny how, what does that mean to you uh, well, it means that I hate technologies that are not immersive. Um, 
So I, 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 I hate these immersive technologies that, that, that swallow us up and cut us off from the world. Um, so you see, in my childhood, when I was growing up, I used to always play in the water every day on the way to and from school. And so I like technologies that don't block me from nature, from the natural world. Well, that seems hard to reconcile with wearing computers on your body all the time. Like if you went in the water, don't you, you know, short out? No, yesterday I swam to Toronto Island. Really? Uh, wearing yeah. all the stuff you wear? Yeah. Now, seriously, I would be afraid that you would electrocute yourself. Well, you know, the thing is um, uh, to design technologies to be immersive. So, uh, so for example, yesterday, I was immersed in technology, but I immersed the technology or submersed the technology in nature. So you can think of the technology as this thing that wraps around us. Think of uh, environment. So the environment is that which is around us, and the environment is us ourselves, and the environment is the boundary between the environment and the environment. So another way of looking at immersivity is I could call myself a environmentalist. <laughs> So well, I was, I was very interested. Sorry, go ahead. Environmentalist is somebody who is for concentrating on the interplay between the environment and the environment. That is to say, on the boundary between us and what's around us. Clothing is an example of that boundary. See, if you have clothes that are not immersive, it's going to keep you out of nature. Whereas, you know, when we are at balance with nature, so, uh, I, you know, if I had to have 10 rules of life, you know, or whatever they are, five rules of life or three rules of life, rule no, one of the rules is or would be in my rules of life is always wear a swimsuit underneath your clothes. And uh, maybe the second rule of life is always bring a dry bag mm -hmm. to throw your clothes into the dry bag so you can tow it behind you when you jump in the lake because you never know when you might encounter nature and want to swim to the island and hang out on the island for a while or something like that. 